Amen. Good to be here. The Lord gave us a good service Sunday. Hallelujah. Amen, amen. And we had a good day Sunday. And uh, thank the good Lord for it. I'm a believer in Christ, folks. I'm a Bible believer, and I believe in the resurrection. You better believe it. And I believe the resurrection of Christ was a physical event. We're not talking about some kind of resurrection of his ideas or his teachings or his, you know, what have you. Can, you can get into all kinds of stuff. No, the person of Christ rose from the dead. Father, we thank you, Lord. We come to your house tonight, meet with our people. And those that are watching on the Internet now, watch it live and watch it later. We ask you to bless, Father. We need you, Lord. Oh, God. We can organize, we can work, we can paint, and we can sew, and we can do whatever needs to be done. But, Father, we cannot do what you alone can do, and we need you tonight. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, now what I'm going to do is take your prayer request first because we need to be praying for Jean Golden. I was told a few minutes ago that her uh, sugar, uh, not sugar, but her oxygen level is down in the 70s, and she needs prayer. Remember, Jean Golden, she's been having a time. She sits over here with her husband, Terry Golden, and, and, and for the last few months, she's been on oxygen. And uh, she needs your prayer tonight, folks. And I'd like to have for us to get together together here in a few minutes, if we could, and just have an altar prayer for her. And there are other prayer requests that we have, too. We have needs. We have a lot of different needs. What I'm trying to do is to find a, a thing that, off of the Internet, because I've been reading these prayer requests and praying for these people. And uh, I, I, there's no way in the world that I can present to you all of the prayer request uh, for the simple fact that we don't have that much time. And that is in no way to try to belittle what's going on because these, these requests are genuine, they're real, and these people have real needs. And I want them to know we're going to be praying for them. How many of you visiting with us tonight first time? I met some folks from West Virginia back here. You folks here in the center, where you all from? Wisconsin. All right. Well, good to have you. Someone else raised the hand over here? Yes, sir? Well, good to have you, brother. Good night. Hey, man, nothing wrong with Knoxville. I'm here. <laughs> I live here. Yeah. Anyone on this side first time? All right. Okay. Well, good to have you. Make yourself at home with us tonight. I'm going to read uh, two prayer requests. And uh, like I say, there are many. And then I'll, we'll get into the prayer requests that you have. And uh, the first one I'm going to read for you tonight is this. As preacher, I had to bury my only two sons, 10 years apart. I'm only 53 years old. I've, I've kept the faith and endured the deepest pain a human could stand. My faith was tested. I choose to stand on the rock, Jesus Christ. God gave me the peace that passes all understanding. I can't explain it. I experienced it. Whoever is reading this, hold on to the nail-scarred hands of Jesus Christ. Amen. We will meet in the air soon. God bless you, preacher, for delivering this message. Amen. This was posted under this past Sunday morning's message uh, here on Easter Sunday. Remember this man in praise lost two sons, folks. You know, that's not to say that his need is any greater than anyone else's, but... There's somebody out there that this speaks directly to. It always does. It makes a difference what you do, what you say, what message you preach, prayer requests you give. There's always someone it speaks directly to. And if you're out there, I hope that you can take to heart what this man said, and it'll be a help and a blessing to you. Hello, Pastor Lawson. I'm a 64-year-old man. I've lived a sinful life listening to your sermons while truck driving and listening since I can't work anymore. I've come to realize I need Christ to help me. I've stopped intentionally sinning. I've tried to turn my life around. I fall short. I hate my, son, my sin, any sin. My problem is that I know Christ is Lord. He died to save us. He rose from death because he is life. I believe. I just don't trust my own mind. I argue with my mind and heart. I tell myself I'm not honest with God. I feel no joy in believing. I feel I'll never be at peace. I don't think I deserve peace and joy. How do I know what I believe is my true faith 
or just me talking garbage like I've always done? How does one know he is saved from hell? Now, that's quite a thing, right? And, and, the, and the replies started coming in. I forget how many of the last time I saw, 10, 12, 15, and they may still continue. People are trying to help him. They're trying to instruct him as to, uh, as to what he needs to do. Folks, there is no formula laid down in the New Testament to be saved. There's a person in the New Testament that is your salvation. It is our responsibility to point you to that person, not some church, not some catechism, not some minister, but a person. But listen to this response. I chose this as one that responded to this man. The response says, I've been there. I understand. This is a little long, but I hope it helps. This is one of my favorite quotes from Charles Spurgeon. And if you don't know Charles Spurgeon, he's a British preacher that lived back in the 1800s, and he's well known. He has a lot of very good stuff. Anyway, this is a quote, Charles Spurgeon, quote, Satan tells me I am unworthy, but I always was unworthy. And yet thou hast long loved me, and therefore my unworthiness cannot be a bar to my having fellowship with thee now. It is true I am weak in faith and prone to fall, but my very feebleness is the reason why I should always be where thou feedest thy flock, that I may be strengthened and preserved in safety beside the still waters. Now, what may get the attention of one person and help lead them to Christ may not work on another person. Whatever the Holy Spirit chooses to use, whatever method, however he does it, here's what he will always do. He will lead you to Christ. He may not lead you down the same path or the same way, but his goal is the same. If where you are in your spiritual journey is taking, to you, taking you to all of your sins or all of your problems or into nothing but condemnation or things of that you can be sure of this, that's not the Holy Spirit. So what do you mean? The Holy Spirit will be part of conviction. Yes, he'll convince the world of sin because they believe not on me. But that conviction has to do with Christ. The Holy Spirit will not lead you away from Christ and have you focus on a bunch of stuff you think you need to clean up to get right with God. No, you need God to get right with God. You need Christ who paid the sin debt so that you can be right with God. And that's the work of the Holy Spirit. On the surface of it, it seems so simple. But in the nuts and bolts of it, when you start dealing with these issues in the person's life, it can get very complicated. I understand that. My conversion was profound. Yes, it was. Out of the clear blue, I was condemned to hell, fire, and damnation. It came on me out of the clear blue, and I couldn't live with it. And so finally, I bowed my head and asked him to save me. And when I said it, I meant it. And when I raised my head up, I was a new creature in Christ Jesus. Everybody's not the same, though, see. And don't, don't base your salvation on mine. Your salvation is based on the person you have inside you. That's Christ Jesus the Lord. And I hope that that kind of, that the, that what I'm saying in a sense like that can be helpful to you tonight. Because, folks, I've been in this battle a long time. I've had to deal face to face with demons. I've looked them right in the eye. I've had to deal with them. Religious demons. And uh, I know what I'm talking about. They can get very pious. These be the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. You say, what's wrong with that? Isn't that right? You know where that came from? That came out of the mouth of a demon-possessed woman. She had the spirit of Python. She had the spirit of a snake. She had the spirit of, uh, of, the, uh, of, the, of the, the, like the oracles of Delphi. Uh, the oracle speaking from a pagan. They'll sense and use, they'll use the truth, but they'll use it to a point where they can turn you away from the truth. They'll give you just enough to get you in their snare. And then once they've ensnared you, all they have to do is add something to what Christ did. And there you go. You're down the wrong path. So please remember, I didn't mean to get into all this preaching tonight. I've got, that's coming up here in a minute. This is what you get for being a preacher, amen. 
Anybody have a request tonight? Yes, ma'am. All right. Yes, ma'am. Amen. Yes, ma'am. If you could please remember, uh, keep Benny in your prayers. He is, uh, he's still not getting well. They, he went to the doctor last Thursday. They were hoping to take the drain out and it was still draining too much. And so he's supposed to go back again tomorrow, but it's still draining. So okay. I don't know what they're going to do. They need wisdom for the doctors to know what to do or Amen. needs a touch from the Lord. Thank Sometimes you. all it takes is a different doctor. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Vivian asked me to request prayer. Dale's having surgery, knee replacement surgery in the morning at 7.30 at Fort Sanders. And then pray for my health. All right. Amen. Okay. Anybody else? Uh, continue to pray for my family and the drug problem and then many other families that deal with the same thing. All right. I'd like to thank everyone in here for, for praying for me and thank God for answered prayer. I'm not going to have to have any more scans. This is all over with. Thank you all for praying. But I have a special request. Uh, many of you know about Noah. He went and had a ultrasound on a spot on yeah, his side. Right. Well, they got the results, and it wasn't enough to tell them what to do with it. So they've scheduled him to see a pediatric surgeon Monday at 2.30 at 2.30 this coming Monday. So please keep him in your prayers and then pray for Nathan and Ashley as well. All right, Thank amen. You. Amen. All right, someone else? Yeah, I just want you to pray for my uh, daughter's uh, mother-in-law. They've uh, hospice, she's on hospice. They've called the family in this afternoon. All right. Just remember that family. Okay, amen. All right. Anybody else? Brother Miller? She'll have the mic to you in a moment. <clears throat> Just want the church to continue to remember my brother. He's uh, got blood cancer. It don't look good for him. Okay, brother. Uh, brother Randy Hall was not he was not able to make it tonight he asked for prayer for uh, his brother's pastor his name is brother Oberman I, I don't know his first name he's gonna have open heart surgery tomorrow he's got a blockage and then his co-workers son his name is Zach Lambert they just found that he has cancer uh, he's got a it's on his neck and he's gonna have to start going through chemo he, he saved he knows the Lord but he uh, he asked for prayer for his son and then uh, just continue to pray for sister Peacock down here in Jacksonville and just uh, Keep her in your prayers. Amen. Amen. Go ahead and mention about your meeting. What you oh, yeah. Um, Saturday, this Saturday, just to remind you, 5 o'clock for the uh, Galatians Bible study. I didn't put it out Sunday because I forgot. So it's uh, And there's a sign-up sheet in the foyer that Brooklyn, my lovely assistant here, put out there. So thank you. All right. Amen. Anybody else up here on the front? Someone in the back? Here you go. Go ahead and get the front first, the back, and then there's no one over here somewhere. Uh, I had a, a cousin that passed away this past uh, Easter Sunday, and uh, they're having her funeral Friday night, and uh, they're having grave sites Saturday. Well, when she had the, uh, when she passed away, her younger sister, uh, they had to take her to the hospital, and she's been in the hospital uh, all week, and they said she might get to come home tomorrow. And the doctor said that her heart was weak, and he, he termed it broken heart syndrome, that uh, she was real bad off. And they said, hopefully, that she'll get to go uh, to the funeral Friday night. So just remember them. They've got a big family. I've preached six members of their family, which is my family's funeral. So they've lost a lot of family members in, in their family. Amen. I ask you all to remember to continue to pray for Victoria and Emma 
from the automobile accident. They both had to go back to UT today. Uh, Victoria is going to have to see a concussion specialist, and Emma is bruised from her knee all the way down in the sprained foot. I'd like to also ask you to remember to pray for my mother. She's been sick all day today, real bad. And remember Shelly tonight, too. She's sick. All right, brother. Amen. All right. Anybody else? All right. Well, you have an unspoken quest tonight. Would you all come down to the front here and let's, let's just have an altar prayer. I'll stand up here and, and uh, try to help lead it. Our Father, you tell us in your word that the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Lord, I'm not righteous, but Christ is. And I'm in him and I believe in him. And Father, you tell us tonight to call unto you and you'll answer us and show us great and mighty things that we know not. And Heavenly Father, you don't have to tell us when, how, you're going to do anything. You tell us that your ways are not our ways, your mind is not our mind. Our Father, you know you can be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. I'd hate to think, Lord, that we come into this house and with all the problems, sicknesses, and the hurts, and the pains of this world, that nobody cares. But I know you care. I know you do. And I know the Holy Spirit has take what's been said tonight, and he'll already be ministering that by the power of Christ and what he's accomplished for us. We pray for them. Heavenly Father, we pray for every need that's here. You know all about them. You know every need. The needs of the folks that I mentioned I read here that's online, those that are watching live and those that will watch later, we pray for them. And we know for some of them it's the only church they have. Our Father, tonight we know, Lord. We know that we need you. And the more we know, the more we grow. If we grow any, the more we know we need you. We need you more than we can imagine how much we need you. And when you say in the Word that without you we can do nothing, I know that, Lord. I've tried it the other way, and you've proved me wrong. I can't do anything without you. And you know when the Apostle Paul says, though we be nothing, and Father, I believe that. I fully I accept it. And the Apostle Lord, who said, he's the chief of sinners. I say that too. My Heavenly Father, I firmly believe in what I've studied in your word. It doesn't mean that he was necessarily doing anything. He's just beginning to understand the essence of what he truly was when you met him on the road to Damascus. And it took him decades to really get a hold of that. It's taken me a while, Lord. But our Father tonight, I'm not perfect. I never will be perfect in this world. I confess to thee, Lord, that I fail. Oh, God, how I fail. Lord, I confess to thee tonight that I need you to cleanse me. And you said if we confess our sins, you're faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Bless these dear folk. Lord, let your blessing come down upon them. Let the unction of the Holy Spirit of God touch every one of them. And may they be able to leave out of this house tonight knowing that they've come, they've talked to you, and you heard them. God, I can only do what a minister can do, what an intercessor could do right now. I can't go to, with them into the places where they need you the most. The Father, you can bless them tonight. Be with them. And Heavenly Father, Lord, touch Jean. Open her lungs up. she get oxygen in her body. she be able to get some air in her soul. Help her, Lord. Help Jean. We pray this now in your holy name. And for Jesus' sake we ask it. Amen. 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 If you have your Bible, I turn to the book of Psalm, chapter number six and verse four. The sixth Psalm.
chapter number 6 and verses 4 and 5. Return, O Lord, deliver my soul. Save me for thy mercy's sake. For in death there is no remembrance of thee. In the grave who shall give thee thanks? Father, bless this word now. Anoint your word and anoint the messenger. In thy name I pray. Amen. You can be seated. The Lord Jesus Christ is called the second man, the last Adam. There's a reason why the Old Testament saint only knew so much about his body. Because the Old Testament saint, for the most part, was talked about in a sense of a dual being, a dichotomy, two, two, not three, although he was three. But in the Old Testament saint, his soul and his spirit, they did not differentiate it that much. And the reason for that is because none of the Old Testament saints were born again. This is why the Gospel of John, when it mentions the new birth, it mentions it long after the kingdom of heaven is rejected on this earth. You notice, why would such an important thing as you must be born again, John chapter number 3, why didn't Matthew, why didn't Mark, why didn't Luke mention it? It's important, you better believe it is, very important, but why didn't they mention it? See, these are the kind of questions you ask yourself, it helps you study the Bible, it helps you understand it. You see, the Old Testament saint knew there was a place called Sheol. All right, Sheol, what is that? That's the unseen state of the dead. It's a place where they go down. and It's translated in some places as the pit, hell, the grave. Sheol is the unseen state of the dead. All right, and why is it like that? It's because they only knew so much in the Old Testament. Notice what he said. For in death there is no remembrance of thee. So he's speaking as if that person has died and we are not too certain about uh, what kind of state they're in. Psalm 115 verse 17, the dead praise not the Lord. Then Genesis 3:19, the Lord said, from dust thou art and unto dust shalt thou return. That shows you the majesty of God. The majesty. Many times at a funeral, I'll hold my hand out like this and I'll say, now imagine my hand full of dirt. Dirt. That's all it is, is dirt. I say, do you realize that all of the history of mankind, all of his accomplishments, all of his achievements, his future, and all of that started from a handful of dirt? And it wasn't man's ability to do anything. It was what the Creator did. What he's able to do. From dust thou art. When Abraham talked to the Lord outside of Sodom and Gomorrah, he said, I know I'm just dust and ashes, but I want to talk to you. And he's going to intercede for someone. Well, anytime you begin to intercede for someone, you begin to stand high in the sight of God because he loves intercessors. Psalm chapter number 30, verse 9 said, What profit is there in my blood when I go down to the pit? See here, the pit. Shall the dust praise thee? Shall it declare thy truth? Well, he's not talking about going down to be punished in hell fire. Like I say, the word Sheol can be translated pit in one place, grave in another. So you've got to keep in mind what you're dealing with in the context. But he says this, shall the dust praise thee? In other words, I'm not too sure what lies beyond. That's what they're saying. It's unclear. Psalm 88, verse 3, For my soul is full of troubles, my life draweth nigh unto the grave. I am counted with them that go down into the pit. I am as a man that hath no strength, free among the dead, like the slain that lie in the grave, whom thou rememberest no more. See that? Like he has no knowledge or no memory of those that have gone on before him. And they are cut off from thy hand. Thou hast laid me in the lowest pit in darkness and the deeps. Thy wrath lieth hard upon me, and thou hast afflicted me with all thy waves. Selah. And any time you see that selah in there, it means to stop, meditate, think it through, and do some praying over it. And see if there may be a message in there for you. In Psalm 88, verse 10, he says, Wilt thou show wonders to the dead? Shall the dead arise and praise thee? Selah. Which leads some of the Old Testament scholars, so-called scholars, and you hear, you, hear, you hear me very, very seldom do you hear me quote scholars, right? <laughs> For one thing, the scholars don't agree among themselves. So which scholar are you quoting? 
Somebody said, well, the scholar says, what scholar? It's not I'm trying to say anything against a scholar. I'm certainly not against learning. Uh, you know, the 50 men who translated the King James Bible, it's a good thing they knew Greek. <laughs> right? So the next time you hear someone up in the pulpit running people down who know Greek, uh, remind them that they wouldn't have a Bible if they couldn't have read uh, and translated Koine Greek. Same with Hebrew and same with Aramaic. So you got to keep that in mind. Study in itself and learning in itself is not a bad thing. The scripture says, study to show thyself approved. Isaiah 38 verse 18 says, For the grave cannot praise thee, death cannot celebrate thee. They that go down to the pit cannot hope for thy truth. So that's a pretty dark thing, isn't it? Even Job, 1,900 years before Christ, 4,000 years ago said, Why died I not from the womb? Why did I not give up the ghost when I came out of the belly? He didn't curse God, but he cursed himself, and he cursed the day he was born. Verse 16, he said, Or as in a hidden, untimely birth I had not been as infants, which never saw the light. Isn't that something? And I've seen that, and I've had to minister to that in the ministry. Babies, that uh, perfectly formed little boy, never saw the light. Carried to, t carried to full term, went into labor, went into labor, full term, just as perfectly beautiful little boy, blue. And that's, uh, that's what you deal with. Now here's what Solomon said in the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 2, verse 24. He says, nothing is better for a man than that he should eat and drink. Ecclesiastes 3, 22. There is nothing better than that a man should rejoice in his own works. Ecclesiastes 5, 18. Behold that which I have seen, it is good and comely for one to Eat, good and comely for one to eat and to drink and to enjoy the good of all his labor that he taketh under the sun all the days of his life. In plain words, he focuses on the life that which is here. This is what Solomon focuses upon and he focuses in the sense of having a good time. If a man beget a hundred children and live, and live many years so that the days of his years be many, and his soul be not filled with good, and also that he have no burial, I say that an untimely birth is better than he. For he cometh in with vanity, and departeth in darkness, and his name shall be covered with darkness. Solomon said, Yea, though he live a thousand years twice told, yet hath he seen no good. Do not all go to one place? So in the mind of Solomon, how much did he know about Sheol? You follow me? See, it's easy today, folks, with the New Testament, the revelation of Scripture, to be able to look back and say, well, why didn't they know this? Or why didn't they know that? Couldn't they understand this? No, the Apostle Peter said the prophets even prophesied of the grace that should come and the gospel message that I should preach. And he said they didn't understand it. The reason they didn't, because it wasn't for them. All Scripture is not necessarily for you. All Scripture is inspired, but it's not necessarily for you. So you have, to be, you have to compare Scripture with Scripture. Solomon said again, Then I commended mirth, because a man hath no better thing under the sun than to eat and drink and be merry. <laughs> That's what he said. Then in chapter 9 he said, For to him that is joined to all the living there is hope. For a living dog is better than a dead lion. You ever heard that one before? A living dog. And, and you understand the context when the Bible uses the word dog. It's not like the culture of today. Nothing like it. He could not use, he could not have used a worse uh, comparison. But in any sense, for the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. So see, here we are with the dead. They don't even, they're not so certain what's there where they go, and they certainly don't believe that they know anything where they go. Now here's one of the problems, and that problem is this. The Constitution, or the essence of an Old Testament saint or Old Testament believer, is not the same as yours. There's a difference. There's a vast difference. And every cult that tries to teach you that your soul is going to lie in the grave and, you're not, and you don't know anything, they'll not get that from the New Testament. They'll have to run to the Old Testament to get that. And this is a great fault. Never take an Old Testament scripture to try to refute a New Testament revelation. 
You hath heard it been said of old time, thus and thus and thus. But I say unto you, who said that? The Lord Jesus said that. So he says that a living dog is better than a dead lion. In chapter 9, he said, Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might, for there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave, whether thou goest. And then finally, this is the one that most people know about. It's Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 1. Remember now thy Creator in the days of thy youth. All right? And then what follows here are, uh, are, uh, are uh, statements about how that the body decays, it gets older, the mind the mind is not as sharp as it used to be. And uh, these are what's called metaphors. And uh, it's, in other words, it's a form of light. That's what, what the word meta. Meta is a Greek preposition to go alongside, you know, metaphysics or so forth and so on. To go alongside for is light, okay? So it is a light that goes alongside the light. In other words, it's a light spoken of in a different way of the same light. Are you following me now? Okay. And so he uses all these things like windows and doors and so forth and so on. And then he said, Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the spirit shall return to God who gave it. In plainer words, Solomon said a man gets old. His teeth falls out. His eyes grow dim. His memory fades. He gains weight. He stumbles and blasts his face against the floor. He can't sleep at night. Woe is me. <laughs> That's our friend Solomon. All right. Amen. I, uh, I looked at this mug today and my shiner is just about gone. Amen. The rest of it's healing up good. But what I am most grateful for is I don't have a swelling brain. That's what I am the most grateful for. Amen. Because I have known people in this church who died. With, uh, I don't think any took a lick and it wasn't any worse than what I had. I hit the deck hard, but God was with me. He was gracious. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 53 says, This corruptible must put on incorruption. This mortal must put on immortality. Now this is the Apostle Paul giving us New Testament revelation. Notice how the wording is different. The spirit is different. It begins to lift up the soul. In 1 Thessalonians 1, 10, And to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. The book of 1 Thessalonians is probably, you can't prove it, but probably the first book of the New Testament that was written. And in every chapter of 1 Thessalonians, there is a direct reference to the second coming of the Lord. Isn't that something? In other words, they were looking for his appearing and said, who raised, who he raised from the dead to wait for his son. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 13, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. Notice, asleep is now what's called a euphemism. What's that mean? A euphemism is taking a word that doesn't have the bite that the, that the, that the, the, the like death would be, like the word death. See, the word death, we understand that, all right? All right, let's call death sleep. So what you've done, you've used a euphemism. I was in the room when my grandfather passed away at UT Hospital in 1969. I'll never forget the nurse looking over at us and saying, he has expired. I'll never forget that. She has, I knew exactly what she meant by that. He has expired. What does that mean? That's a euphemism for he has breathed his last. To expire means that the breath goes out. Inspire means it comes in. And so he was gone. I'm glad I was with him. He will live 92 years. He was born in 1878, died in 1969. My grandfather, and I was there with him at UT Hospital. He raised him from the dead. 1 Thessalonians 4, I would not have to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. You saw or not even as others which have no hope for. If we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. And the Colosseum in Rome, how many has ever seen that? Colosseum, and I'm not saying been there personally, I haven't. I'd like to see it, I haven't been there. But I've seen many videos and photographs of the Colosseum. Did you know that that Colosseum was built with, uh, with wealth that was pilfered from Jerusalem? Did you know that? The Jews' money, their wealth was taken to build the Colosseum in Rome. 
And of course the Colosseum in Rome was used as a, as a place to torture, torment, and murder our brothers and sisters in Christ. They suffered every kind of torment you can imagine. And they went off out of this world, some of them singing and holding hands and glorifying God because they knew death wasn't the end of anything. It was just the beginning. Amen. And they were martyrs, martyrs for their faith in Christ. And by the way, our brothers and sisters are still dying the martyr's death for their faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. They still are. Yes, they are. So we believe that he rose. They that sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. He uses the term sleep a number of times. First Corinthians 15, we shall not all sleep. The Bible says in John 11, verse 11, these things said he, and after that he saith unto them, our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may awake him out of sleep. Who said that? Our Lord did. All right. Then he said to his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he'll do well. Howbeit Jesus spake of his death, but they thought that he had spoken of taking of rest and sleep. Then said Jesus unto them plainly, and this is for their understanding so that they can make sense of what's going on. He was giving them a further revelation, but they couldn't get a hold of it. See, he told them that Lazarus was asleep. All right. Sleep in the sense that he was no longer active here on this earth. All right. And here's what he said. Lazarus is dead. So that's what you need to understand. And so he said that. In Acts chapter number 7, when they stoned Stephen to death, the Bible said he fell asleep. And uh, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not even as others which have no hope. Now let's let the Bible define the sleeping, okay? Now think about this for a moment. The Scripture is going to use this to define sleeping. Say, there's a huge graveyard behind us. How many know that? It's within a stone's throw. When you walk out of here tonight, just look across here. I've been in that graveyard, Lord only, I have no idea. How many times? The funerals down through the years. It's, it's nearby, huge. A road runs right down through the middle of it. It's on both sides of the road. It's old. Graveyard's been there a long time. Now here's what he says. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus, notice, will God bring with him. He didn't say he's going to raise him from the dead or raise him from the ground. He's going to bring them with him. So where are they? Well, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. That's right. And remember now, we're getting into the area where people are born of the Spirit of God. And so therefore, Body, soul, and spirit are three unique, distinct essences or parts that make up a human being. Body, soul, and spirit. That's very important to understand because there's a difference in the understanding of one who loves the Lord and who has passed on uh, today and one who loved the Lord and passed on in the Old Testament. There's a difference. There's a big difference. The Bible says in Philippians chapter number three, our conversation is in heaven from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, most would say, well, that simply means that, uh, you know, our citizenship is in heaven and that uh, therefore we can reckon ourselves as pilgrims and strangers and we have no continuing city on this earth. And we're like Abraham, we're tent dwellers and we're moving about and we don't put roots down on this earth. That's okay. But it may go a little further than that. So what do you mean? Remember this, you are a spirit being, okay? Ask your doctor or ask someone in medical science. Oh, by the way, you said that so-and-so's life just passed from them. Would you please define what life is? Oh, I know you've got your machines, you're plugged up, you've got, uh, you've got, you know, the heart rate and all of that, oxygen content in the blood. But would you please tell me what life is. They can't tell you what life is. You know why? Because the life in your flesh is spirit. You are a spirit being that has a soul living in a body. And now in the New Testament that you're born again, see, this is why you're able to do that. 
The Lord Jesus Christ, when he showed up 2,000 years ago, was the God-man. He was the first man to ever walk on the face of this earth, body, soul, and spirit, perfect and unique. No man ever lived before him like that. He was the only one. And he, therefore, is the last Adam, second man, that every future human being, in order for them to exist through eternity, they must come through the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, they're not a man, because he's the last Adam. The worst curse you could ever give anything is to make it live forever without the love of God and without the body of God and without the power of God and without the spirit of God. In other words, without God. That would be a curse that you would never want. You would never want it. Eternity after eternity. Ice tone ionon, tone ionon. In Greek, I just quoted Greek to you, and that means unto the ages of the ages. Imagine living forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. And you're not in a glorified body. You're not with God but you are existing essentially about the same as you exist now, would you want to live forever like that? Why, good night, no, you wouldn't. That would be a curse. And this is why he said to them, don't let them eat from the tree of life. And when you go back and look at that in Hebrew, the text in your Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, Hebrew Old Testament, when you look at that, the sentence doesn't end. It's a, it's, 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 it's a kind of a rhetorical statement. In plainer words, I will not allow a man to eat from this tree of life who is not born again and exists forever. That's what that means. Think it through. <laughs> Think about it. Think about what I just said to you. Because nobody was born again until Christ died on that cross, was buried, and rose again the third day. And so therefore, when he rose the third day, he ratified the New Testament. And without the death of the testator, the testament is not in force. And the message I preached this past Sunday morning, all those great things that led up to the resurrection of Christ, everyone in its context is wonderful. But not a one of them can save you if Christ did not rise from the dead. How many agree with that? <laughs> the Christian faith is absolutely built upon the resurrection of Christ. And if Christ be not raised, read, read 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the argument the apostle lays out, the strongest argument in the Bible. The apostle Paul lays it out, and he starts with the gospel. I declare to you the gospel, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried, and then he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. We today live because he says, because I live, ye shall live also. John on the Isle of Patmos said, I am he that liveth. In other words, I'm the living one. And he said, John, I was dead. And he said, I am alive now, John, forevermore. Amen. Amen. And the whole book of Revelation is based on that because that's where it starts. It starts with the glorified Christ declaring that he is alive forevermore. Amen. Huh. Praise be unto God for that. Amen. In Daniel chapter 12, and many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. See that? See this prophecy of Daniel? You notice that? Many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Now, where are the dead right now, the unsaved dead? Where do they go? They don't go to heaven. In Luke chapter 16, the rich man died, Lazarus died, and the rich man died. All right, the rich man lifted up his eyes in Hades. Okay, that's the New Testament counterpart of Sheol. But the difference in the New Testament with Hades is that there was a gulf fixed between two sides. One side was Abraham's bosom, and the other side was the pit, burning, burning damnation. And the rich man lifted up his eyes in hell, it says, in hell. All right, and that's where he was, and that's where he stayed until they come out. But those that have died in the Lord, they're gone already. Yes. 
in Ephesians chapter number 4, it says, But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, When he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? Do I take that literally? Do I believe that the, that the lower parts of this earth houses Hades or Sheol? Yes, I take it literally. I have no reason to believe otherwise. That the lower parts of the earth. And then he that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens that he might fill all things. So he led captivity captive. Who did he lead? He didn't lead the unsaved. They're still there. He led the saved. He led them out of why did he do that? He did that because now they are, I don't know when you use the word qualified, that's not, as, that's not a strong enough word. Now they are, now they are they're ready. They've been prepared. They can enter into the very presence of Almighty God into the third heaven. And the only way they're going to get there is by the new birth. So he says, knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus. Now here's what Paul said about this life. He said, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Now, you either take that from a man who knew what he was talking about or he's a lunatic, right? And there's an awful lot of people out there when they read that and they don't believe the Bible, they say, well, this Paul was a lunatic. He believed that he was better off dead. He said, but if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I wot not. For I am in a strait betwixt two. In plain words, I halt between two opinions. Having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Amen. <laughs> and he says plainly, we know if their earthly house or this tabernacle were dissolved. So this body is not going to go any further than where it came from. This is it. It's earthbound. The earthly house of this tabernacle dissolved. We have a building of God and a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Therefore, we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be where? Present with the Lord. I was watching a thing the other night. It had, they've, 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 they've got some... Apparently, now, if, you, if they're to be believed, and I don't know if I have any reason not to believe them, some wonderful photographs of the surface of Mars. Have you ever seen that? It's quite remarkable. I mean, it's remarkable. You can even see down to the rocks. And I, and I looked at that, and I thought to myself, here is this thing. That if you didn't know it was Mars, you'd think you were looking out here in the desert somewhere. You know, it's not... It, it essentially, it's, uh, it looks like this Earth. Now, it's, of course, it's called the Red Planet. But then the first thought that came to my mind, there's not a living soul anywhere on that thing. And the second thought that came to my mind, why is it we're here and we're not there? And this is the question that the theoretical physicists deal with every day. Why did life start here and not there? And of course, a lot of these physicists now, they believe in panspermia. What's panspermia? Panspermia, spermatozoa is the Greek word for a seed of life, zoa's life, sperm seed, spermatozoa is the seed of life. Panspermia means that from one place the, the sperm was taken to another place. In plainer words, something out there brought us down to here. A lot of them are teaching that, believe it or not, because they have no other explanation. Once you run out of theories, what are you going to do? And so that's what they're teaching people, teaching a lot of them. A lot of them believe that. I don't believe that. We don't, I don't believe that at all. I believe my body came from the dust of the ground, and I believe that my life came from the breath of God. Amen. That's what the Bible says. Amen. Amen. And so therefore man is associated with breath until he expires, and the breath leaves his body. All right? Note carefully. Spirits don't have to breathe. That means that when your spirit sails from here and goes off into the third heaven, the presence of God, you don't have to breathe. <laughs> you ever thought about that? You don't have to breathe. The breathing is for the, lung, is for the body. Okay? And you might as well just get used to the fact tonight. I pretty well come to terms with it. 
that my body's about finished. I try to, I try to feed it and uh, try to keep it as clean as I can and uh, keep it out of as many car wrecks as I can stay away from and, and uh, you know, all the problems, learned a few of them. And but one day it's going to be finished. It's going to be, it's going to be finished. It'll, it'll run its course. What are you going to do? If you're not a believer in Christ, what are you going to do? Because that's inevitable. Yeah. What are you going to do? Your body's going to run out. You got these young people on TV there, everybody, I mean, it's these, these exercise studios, and they're doing their thing, man, they're jumping around, they're going, all, all this stuff, and uh, they act like they think they're going to live forever. Well, it's easy for a 30-year-old to jump up and down and run. I, I used to run, too, when I was 30 years old. Rod, I ride my bike 22 miles, did all that, climbed all these hills around here, jogged all over the place, but it didn't stop me from getting to be 77. <laughs> didn't do a thing. Not a thing. So what do you do? Well, here's what you do. I appreciate the old body. I really do. I'm going to try to take care of it. I appreciate it. I got, kind of got to know it after all these years, you know. But one day I'm going to lay it down. I'm going to lay it down. I'm going to lay it down. And I am going to leave it. I'm going to leave it behind. And I'm going to be gone. And I'm going to be gone to the one that I love tonight and whom I have believed. And he's able to keep that which I've committed to him against that day. Yes, I am. I'll be with the Lord. I hope you are. I hope you know that. If you don't know that, what do I do, preacher, to be saved? No, it's not what you do. It's what someone has already done for you. That's the clear message of the gospel. If you're willing tonight to say, Lord Jesus, I don't understand a lot of theology. I don't, I don't even know the books of the Bible. I don't know this, don't know that, make a difference with you know. But Lord Jesus, I got no hope without you. There's nowhere to go but you. You're the Savior. You're the only one that can save me. Lord Jesus, I want you in my soul. I want you. I want you. I'm going to take a hold of you and I'm not going to turn loose of you. And I, everything that's in me, I'm going to trust you to be my Savior. I'm going to tell you something. You start talking like that, you'll be saved. Yes, you will. You will, because you've accepted the one who is the Savior. Bow your head. Father, in Jesus' name, I've given out what you gave me best I could. And I pray that you'd use it tonight. There may be someone in this house right here. That man who wrote there that's, uh, that I quoted tonight from, 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 uh, from uh, YouTube, he may be watching. I don't know. But Lord, somehow or another, make it as plain and simple as we know how. The Lord Jesus Christ is our salvation. It's him. It's him. Take him at his promise. He said to us, he told us plainly, if any man comes unto me, I will in no wise cast him out. Oh, God, let us take hold of that. That's a promise from the lips of our Lord Jesus Christ. You told us in John, he that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son hath not life. Lord, you didn't tell us we had to be saved through somebody's church. You didn't tell us we had to be saved through doing something, earning it. You told us plainly, Christ is salvation, and we receive him tonight in Jesus' name. And while your head is bowed, do you know that you know that you know that he abides in your soul? Not intellectually in your mind. That's fine if you believe intellectually who he is. That's all right, but that's not saving. Saving is when it gets into the heart, into the depths of who you are, that you're taking hold of him. And you're abandoning everything else. Your goodness, your good works, your morality. You're abandoning it. You're turning your back on it. And you're saying, Lord Jesus, I have nothing that I can turn to but you. And I take you tonight as my Savior. Would you do that? Anybody raise your hand and say, Preacher, won't you pray for me? God bless you. God bless you. I knew somebody. Anybody else raise your hand and say, Pray for me, Preacher. Now, Father, I pray for that hand that went up. Lord, you know that I don't claim to be able to save anything, but I can give them the message and I can tell them about Christ. Lord, may they in simple childlike faith reach out and take hold of you the way they do it and embrace you and pull you into their heart and believe on you and receive you as the free gift of God, as their Savior. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.
Amen. Amen. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Let's stand up tonight when I have a word of prayer. If anybody would like to come down here and talk to me after the service and have me pray with you, I'll be glad, more than happy, to pray with you about your soul. I'll be glad to. I'll be, I'll be standing down here waiting if you want to come down. Father, bless your word. Bless the good folk as they leave. Keep them safe. And Lord, bring us back again this coming Lord's Day. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, folks.